Hello everyone and welcome once again to our Bible study. I'm Stan Simonton, pastor of Katy Community Church. Glad you could be with us. We are studying a series of our spiritual assets. Today we're going to talk about being a new creation in Christ. But before we begin, let's pause for a moment of silent prayer. This gives us each the opportunity to examine ourselves and make sure that we're in fellowship with God and prepared for the teaching of his word. The way we do this is by using the rebound technique, if necessary, which is based on 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which says, If we will confess our sins, which means to acknowledge or admit our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is once again our privilege. We thank you for the and the opportunity to come together and study your word. We pray, Father, that you will help each one of us as we study this important doctrine of a new creation in Christ. Help us with our understanding and application to our individual lives, that we may continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The verse that's often uh, quoted with regard to this doctrine of being a new creation in Christ is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It's a verse that's quoted a lot, but not very well understood in many cases. This verse says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So let's examine this verse so that we can get the true meaning. First, we must consider the context of the passage in order to reach an accurate interpretation. This is called hermeneutics. It's the way that we interpret scripture is by comparing scripture with scripture, by reading the entire context of what the writer is talking about and who he's writing to and the time in which it was written. All these things are important for getting an accurate interpretation of Scripture. In the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is the results of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is when believers are placed into union with Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. This union with Christ is neither seen nor felt. It's not an emotional experience. It is our union with Christ that gives us the potential for a personal sense of destiny, in other words, living life in light of eternity, knowing that we have a, uh, a place prepared for us in heaven, according to Jesus, in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, where he says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will return again, that where I am, there you may be also. It is in light of this doctrinal truth, Paul says that we are new creations in Christ, and the old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. Now, here's the kicker if you will. Contrary to popular belief, and I've heard this most of my life as, as a Christian, the phrase new things have come is not a reference to a person's lifestyle or bad behavior. We know this from the original language of scripture and from many other passages. Once a person trusts Christ as Savior, they believe that he died on the cross, that he paid the penalty for their sin. God gives them eternal life, but their lifestyle does not automatically change. It takes spiritual growth for your life as a believer to change. It takes the study 
and application of accurate Bible doctrine. Without that, there is no spiritual growth. If there needs to be a change, and most often there does, then the only legitimate change must come from spiritual growth based on the Word of God and not on reforming one's life. As a matter of fact, this passage refers to what God does, as we will see. What he does for us, not what we do for God. Becoming a new creation in Christ is God's grace. It's a matter of God's grace. Therefore, all human effort is eliminated. The reason a person becomes a new creation is that they are in union with Jesus Christ. The moment that you trusted Christ as your Savior, many things happen to you. We've been studying them. We call them the 40 assets, the 40 spiritual assets. One of those assets is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit has been misconstrued into some emotional experience that a Christian has either at salvation or after salvation, which is a totally false doctrine. And those who teach it are false teachers. Whether they're in the pulpit or out of the pulpit, doesn't matter. Remember that Satan, those who minister for him, present themselves as ministers of righteousness and angels of light. Satan is the greatest counterfeiter that has ever, there has ever been. He's been observing for mankind for thousands of years. And he knows how to deceive us. And one of the ways he does that is through some truth mixed with a lot of false doctrine. So you have to be careful. You have to have your antennas up, so to speak. You have to be discerning to be able to catch these errors in doctrine. And this is one place where a lot of people err with regard to being a new creation in Christ. The very first word of verse 17 that I read to you a few minutes ago when we began is the word therefore. In the Greek, the word for therefore is hoste, H-O-S-T-E, and can be better translated conclusion. So what is Paul saying? I'm going to give you the conclusion to what I've just been teaching you in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. Paul looks back at the context of the passage that he's written to the church at Corinth and draws a conclusion based on previous doctrinal information. The conclusion is if, and that's a first class condition, it means if and it's true, any person in Christ becomes a new creation. If you're in Christ, the only way to become in Christ is by believing that he died on the cross and paid for your sins, apart from any works, apart from any effort on your part. Salvation has nothing whatsoever to do with what you do or don't do other than one simple non-meritorious act, and that is belief, faith. Believing what Christ did for you on the cross. The word creation here in chapter 5, verse 17 of 1 Corinthians is the Greek word kistos. Refers primarily to the creative act in process. It is believers who are being acted upon by God. This 
act of creation is when God actually creates in you the moment that you believe a human spirit something you did not possess prior to salvation. Prior to salvation, you had a body and you had a soul. What you did not have was a human spirit. It is the human spirit that is our connection with God. And the only way to have a human spirit is by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. It's a brand new nature. In order to better understand what Paul was teaching, we'll use the term a new spiritual classification, something that did not exist prior to salvation. And the reason we use this term is it describes more precisely what occurs at salvation. The creative act by God creates something in believers that previously did not exist. It is new and uh, new. It's new spiritual nature. And believers become different. They become a different classification. What do they become? They become royal family of God, children of God. Prior to that, you were just a creation of God. Every human being is a creation of God, but not every human being is a child of God. The only way you can become a child of God is by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. If you want some reference verses, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 14, Galatians 6, 10, and Ephesians 2, 19. Now, prior to salvation... A person is merely God's creation, but not part of his family. Becoming a part of God's family is, once again, a matter of believing in Jesus Christ as Savior. This act of faith in Jesus Christ places a person into union with Christ, and they instantaneously become a child of God. Before salvation, a person was spiritually dead. He was separated from God. He had no human spirit. He had no connection to God. However, after salvation, a person is spiritually alive. They've been reconciled, the Bible tells us, in this same uh, chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, that they've been reconciled to God. In other words, reconciliation is where we make peace with God through our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we call peace with God. That's salvation. So becoming a new creation sets up a potential for every person who becomes a believer. This potential is what we call in theology experiential sanctification. Experiential sanctification is a term used for setting ourselves apart on a daily basis to God. That's what the word sanctification means. It means to be set apart. There are actually three aspects of sanctification. The first is positional, our position in Christ, how God sees us. The fact that we're in Christ, that's how we stand before God. Remember that the moment you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, God did something miraculous for each one of us. He gave us as a free gift his righteousness. Same chapter here in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So that's Positional sanctification. We are permanently set apart to God, positionally. But experientially, we still have a sin nature, and we still commit sin, and we still have to make the decision on a consistent basis 
to allow God the Holy Spirit to, to develop the character of Jesus Christ in our lives. That's experiential sanctification. And it's temporary, by the way. So what's the difference? The difference is that every human being before salvation has the potential for positional sanctification by believing in Christ. When a person becomes a believer in Christ, they are permanently set apart to God. Their position in Christ never changes, regardless of their spiritual advance, whether they ever advance one iota in the Christian life. If they believed in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, then they have eternal life. And they cannot lose that eternal life because it's exactly what God called it. Jesus himself said it in John 3.16. It is eternal life that he gives us upon our faith in him. And eternal means just that. It means eternal. So when a believers choose to allow the Holy Spirit to guide their lives, empower them to live the Christian life, they can be set apart to God on a consistent basis. That's experiential. That's your experience, daily experience. And once again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says that, Behold, all things are new, and all things are have passed away. Well, old things is actually, in Greek, one word. And it's an interesting word, and you'll probably recognize it. In Greek, it's archaios. A-R-C-H-A-I-O-S. Archaios is where we get the word archaic from. And literally means ex with that which existed in the beginning. It's a reference to something that is ancient, something in the past. It refers to something that is thousands of years old. So what exactly passes away at salvation that would fit the meaning of this Greek word archaos? Old things. Old things have passed away. The context actually makes it very clear. You don't even have to know the Greek language in order to understand this. If you understand the context in which this is written and you really examine the scripture, it's a reference to an old condition. What is that old condition that every human being shares? Spiritual death, separation from God. The moment that we believe, or excuse me, that the, the moment that we are born, God imputes to us Adam's original sin. And that original sin is what condemns us. That's what condemns us to spiritual death. And we need to be made spiritually alive. And that's what happens when we believe in Christ as our Savior. We become spiritually alive. So what passes away is not your old lifestyle. You don't automatically become this holy person, this righteous person. How you stand before God is a change. But your lifestyle does not necessarily change right away. Hopefully it will. But if it never changes, you still have eternal life. And those preachers out there, and there's hundreds of them, that are preaching the false doctrine of what we term as lordship salvation, say that if you don't continue to follow the Lord, whatever that means, because they are the ones who are defining it, and don't live a righteous life as they define it, then you never did believe in the first place. You never were a Christian. That is false doctrine. 
The moment you trust Christ as your Savior, I don't care how old you are, it doesn't matter whether you were a child or whether you were an adult or somewhere in between. At that very moment, God gave you eternal life and he does not take back his gifts. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace, that's God's mercy, for by grace are you saved, that's salvation, and that not of yourselves. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift from God, not of works lest any man should boast. So what passes away the moment you trust Christ as Savior is spiritual death, not your bad habits. Now, hopefully, all of us will change our bad habits if they're indeed bad habits, right? So thousands of years ago, our original parents, Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God, they sinned, they ate of the forbidden fruit, and the result was spiritual death. Spiritual death, spiritual death passed to every member of the human race as a result of their disobedience. And it's spiritual death that Paul has in view when he uses that Greek word archaos, ancient. The word passed away in Greek means to go, to pass, to come to an end, to disappear, or to neutralize. In our passage, it means that spiritual death has gone, it's passed away, it's come to an end. Because the moment you trust Christ as your Savior, you're no longer spiritually dead. Now you're spiritually alive. You have a human spirit. You have something new from God that you never had before. Never again will you be spiritually dead. You can reject the Christian way of life. You can turn your back on God. You can turn your back on his word. But you can never be spiritually dead again. This is the magnificence of God's grace. Romans 6, verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. Wages are something that you earn. We earn spiritual death because of Adam's original sin that's imputed to us at birth. But that verse goes on to say, But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, what are the new things that, that have come? Well, it's that new classification, new creation in Christ, new creature, if you will, some translations use. And all of that entails for the believer in Jesus Christ. So these new things are becoming a new classification, and everything else that God has for us as believers. A better translation, perhaps, would be, Behold, they have become new. Even the word new in Greek gives us further insight on this phrase, All things become new. There are two words in Greek for new. One of them is neos, N-E-O-S. The other is kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S. Neos means new in time. It means young or that which is recent. The word chaos, the Greek word chaos, means new in form, new in quality, or different in nature. And guess which word Paul uses in this context? You guessed it. Chaos. K-A-I-N-O-S. 
That's what he used to describe the new creation in Christ. When believers receive this new nature. This nature is from God, and this nature is spiritual. Receiving this nature is not a matter of reforming your life or quitting your bad habits. Receiving this nature is strictly a matter of God's grace provision. This transforming power of God the Holy Spirit places us into union with Jesus Christ and sets us apart to God for all eternity. In case there's any doubt about the true meaning of this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, the next verse, clarifies what this is talking about. Here's what it says. It says, Now all things are from God, who reconciled us to himself. He didn't need to be reconciled to us. We needed to be reconciled to him who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The all things are from God, not from man. It has nothing to do with mankind. It's from God. And it is God that reconciles us. This eliminates any thought of any religious tabooism, you know, all the do's and don'ts that religion tries to put on people or any form of legalism. You do not give up anything to become a creation in Christ, nor do you start doing something to become a new creation in Christ. You are a new creation because you are in union with Christ and for no other reason. Salvation is a matter of faith alone, in Christ alone has absolutely nothing to do with good works or human merit. You cannot earn your salvation. Christ paid the penalty. He did all the work on the cross so that we don't have to do the work. Now all we have to do is believe what he did for us, that he took our place, became our substitute on the cross. Christ's spiritual death has already done all the work on behalf of all of us, the entire human race, past, present, and future. Every human being's sin has been paid for on the cross by Jesus Christ. It was a substitutionary spiritual death on the cross that paid the penalty for sin and set up the potential of everlasting life for every member of the human race. Now, it's only potential. We still have to use our free will, our volition, and choose to believe in Jesus Christ because God never forces anyone to believe in Christ. And the other false doctrine that's preached out there by many of the same preachers who preach lordship, lordship salvation is that God chose certain people in eternity past for salvation and also chose those who would not believe, which is false doctrine. God knew who was going to believe and who wasn't going to believe because he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows the past. He knows the present. He knows the future. And he's always known that. But he didn't make the decision you still make the decision as to whether or not you are going to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's not predetermined. The only thing that's predetermined is what's going to happen when you do believe in Jesus Christ, when you make that free will choice to believe in Jesus Christ. God has predetermined that. That's what we're studying right now is these 40 assets. Those are predetermined in eternity past by God. That the moment you believe in Jesus Christ in the age in which we live, all 40 of these things are going to be yours. Everlasting life is a gift from God to any person who believes in his son, Jesus Christ as Savior. 
Everlasting life is strictly a matter of God's grace, which eliminates all forms of human works. Church membership, being good, being baptized in water, giving money, any of those things have nothing whatsoever to do with salvation. Believing is what has to do with salvation. Believing means that you are no longer depending on yourself or your good works to uh, obtain eternal life in heaven, but you are depending upon God. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I hope this is cleared up for you if you were confused or if you've heard these phrases used by preachers before and thought that a person has to change their lifestyle in order to be a new creation in Christ. You don't. All you have to do is believe and you become a new creation immediately. Now through spiritual growth, your lifestyle is most likely going to change. And when there needs to be change, then you use your volition and the doctrine found in the Word of God to make those changes. So in reality, we all should really be changing. Changing the way we think, our attitude, our actions, our words, all those should change, certainly, after salvation. But if they don't change, you don't lose your salvation. That's the point. Thanks for joining. Hope you have a good week. We'll see you next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact of your word. It tells us we are new creations in Christ the very instant we believe in your son, Jesus Christ, for salvation. We are thankful it has nothing to do with our good behavior or our bad behavior, but simply a matter of faith. You've made salvation so easy for the entire human race because of the substitutionary work that Christ did for us on the cross. So help us with our understanding and application to this very important doctrine. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.